Okay, well, uh, let's go ahead and get, get started here uh, for today. So, um, you don't have to turn in your problem set now, but if you want to, you can. Um, so, um, or just after class instead of having a run down here. But um, I decided to delay the, the uh, problem set due date because there are people that really need to leave campus and go to, you know, Denver or Longmont or wherever. So, okay. So I delayed that. I also made an announcement that um, I'm going to delay quiz um, quiz 10. Obviously, that's not for traveling reasons, online quiz. Um, but I wasn't entirely sure where I was going to get to today in today's lecture. So I just decided, let's just push it off. Uh, I think that we'll get to a place in today's lecture that you could probably go ahead and take it. Uh, but uh, just to, you know, I mean, you can wait until Friday, okay? Make sure that you get it done um, on Friday, though, okay? Um, I, the last thing I want to say, um, I also posted, um, I, and I said I would do this, that video of the electron transport chain that I showed you at least part, portion of that, the complex one. So that's been posted in, in lecture nine uh, module in Canvas. So take a look at that. There's like seven minutes of material in that. Um, it's actually really good. So um, some of it we didn't really cover in this class, but it gives you a little bit more complete picture of electron transport chain. Okay? All right. So uh, a riddle, what animal can jump higher than a five-story building? Huh? Not a bird. No, these are jumping animals. No one knows? Superman is, is no, this is, these are real. The, I can jump a five story, but I'm Captain America, but anyway. All of them? All of them. That's right. Because yeah. buildings don't jump. <laughs> right? It's a fact, right? I mean, it's a fact. Buildings don't jump. Animals do. So animals, all of them jump higher than five story buildings. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, okay. I'm just going to leave it at that, okay? So it's a, that's a good snow day riddle, I guess. Uh, not a snow day yet. It's a snow day in uh, 60 minutes. Okay, anyway. So, uh, so um, we left off right here um, on Monday. So, um, and we're looking at really a table that covers what we had done in our last group work. Uh, essentially calculating how much ATP can be generated from a single glucose oxidation event, okay, one molecule of glucose. Uh, this does, though, assume uh, that NADH, uh, the PO ratios of NADH equals 2.5 ATP and FADH2 equals 1.5 ATP, which I said that is also going to assume a C ring of nine subunits. So we may or may not get to the C ring today. We'll find out, okay? We'll certainly we'll get to it on Friday if we don't get to it today. All right, but I wanted to go ahead and start off with a question today. This one is not like the riddle, okay? So um, this one is a little bit less tricky in, the, in that regard, okay? Um, but uh, our, our question here, and this is going to be um, really helping us sum up everything that we learn about electron transport chain, but it says this. It's an individual is found dead next to a bottle of Tylenol in a pool of vomit. Uh, autopsy report demonstrate that the individual had a massive damage to their lungs and heart leading to their death. Furthermore, lactate levels in the blood were up as were NADH levels while NAD plus levels were low. Blood oxygen levels were fine, however. All uh, blood oxygen levels were fine. However, all signs point to the fact that this individual died of hypoxia. Okay. Um, how can this be explained? So, um, you got two minutes. Talk to your, your neighbor about this. What do you think is causing these results? Try and take into account, I mean, you don't have to explain why NADH levels are high and NADH levels are low, or NAD plus levels are low and lactate levels are high, but that's certainly some clues there, okay? All right, so um, talk to your neighbor about this. I'll give you a minute. I can actually give you two minutes on this one, okay? Go.
Come on, 30 seconds left, so go ahead and submit that answer. Uh, no, go ahead and submit something and then, I know, I'm sorry. Okay, 10 seconds, stressful. Okay, all right, if you didn't get an answer in, Come and see me, okay? After class, I'll give you credit for being here. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at these results here, okay? So, um, alveoli are broken. No, the donating of uh, electrons from NADH to FMN was inhibited, leading to forever sleep. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, they died from electron transport chain. Okay, NADH production was slow due to extreme concentration of acetaminophen in the liver. Okay, um, hypoxia reduces the flux of aerobic respiration. Um, RS production lack antioxidants. Okay, so electron transport chain is not working. Okay, um, magic. Someone said magic. Okay, uh, something is not. Okay, so there's <laughs> the Rockies didn't lose. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> the Rockies didn't lose today. It is a good day to be a Rockies fan, and the reason is is because they can't lose today. It's a good day. The previous, like, eight days haven't been so great, though. But anyway, um, again, if they score more runs than the other team, then we should have no problem. But that's not happening. All right, so there's some interesting answers as I kind of gl uh, glance through these. I'm going to go ahead and highlight this one. Something is not allowing oxygen into the inside. Um, that's the kind of what we're looking at here. And then we've got something here. This is kind of hinting around the right answer as well. The donating of electrons from NADH to FMN was inhibited leading to forever sleep. Okay, something along those lines. Um, so there, there could be a, a number of different explanations for this um, as we look at these pieces of data. Well, let me give you one plausible answer, okay? Um, the reason I highlighted some of them um, is because they were uh, indicating that maybe the electron transport chain was inhibited in some way, okay? And that is indeed um, a, a good explanation of the data. So we come back here, okay? Um, and that, those results are, are probably most consistent with something called cyanide poisoning, okay? So cyanide is a notorious, of course, toxin. Um, and the, the Tylenol is more of a red herring. Actually, um, interestingly, I think it was in the 1970s, uh, there was, I think in the suburbs of Chicago, someone uh, slipped into a drugstore and opened up multiple bottles of Tylenol and dumped cyanide in them, so laced the Tylenol with cyanide. Uh, ended up killing about 10 to 15 people. All of them had symptoms like what was just described here. That, of course, led to you know, the impossible packaging that we find today. Um, don't use this if the seal has been broken. That kind of thing, that, didn't ha that those weren't present in the 1970s. Okay, but interesting, let's, let's just look at one explanation of this data, um, and let's just say that it was indeed cyanide poisoning. So cyanide is a really simple molecule, it's just C triple bond to uh, a carbon triple bonded to a, a nitrogen with a negative charge on it. All right, but cyanide will block this process. Okay, so we'll just put a little C in there, and we'll just say that then oxygen can't be used. Right now, that would explain then hypoxic type symptoms despite levels of oxygen being normal. Okay, blood plasma oxygen levels were normal, but oxygen wasn't being utilized by tissues because cyanide had sneaked into the mitochondria, bound to um, actually it binds to heme A3 on complex four. Okay, I showed you at heme A3 on complex four, there's an oxygen binding site on that heme group. Sinai can form a covalent bond to that. It's actually stronger than oxygen bond to that. Okay, and so it's a competitive inhibitor of that. Now, what that does then uh, is that electrons can still enter into the electron transport chain through the various sources that we've talked about, NADH, um, and of course succinate um, and other sources. Uh, however, there's no way for those electrons to leave the electron transport chain because the, the back door, if you will, the terminal electron acceptor has been, is, is gone. The back door has been closed. So electrons will start to then accumulate in the electron transport chain. 
Okay, um, and so you know this process of cytochrome C giving up as electrons to complex four will be inhibited, um, and then that means the Q cycle will be inhibited, and complex two will be inhibited, and complex one will be inhibited. Okay, that will lead to oxidative stress, no doubt. Okay, because um, you're going to start to accumulate um, lots of electrons in uh, the electron transport chain. Oxygen levels are fine, but they're not being used. So oxidative stress is going to go up in this environment. Okay. Uh, not only that, but something else to mention here is that this molecule, NADH, because it can no longer feed electrons into the electron transport chain, will also start to rise. That will feed back and inhibit the citric acid cycle. Okay. It will also activate py pyruvate dehydrogenase complex kinase, which will then inhibit, it, inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. All right. So, uh, pyruvate will no longer be converted to acetyl-CoA. Pyruvate will then be converted to lactate, and that's why we see elevated lactate levels. Right? So you see elevated NADH levels, elevated lactate levels, low levels of NAD+, oxidative stress would be a, a problem in this. That will probably lead to the, the tissue damage that was described in the lung and the heart, okay? oxidative stress, because that's where your highest levels of oxygen are going to be. Not to mention the fact that ATP concentrations are going to be going down as well. Okay, not only in those tissues, but also in your neuronal tissue. Okay, presuming that cyanide can um, get into those environments. Okay, so very deadly. It's going to kill you, um, or as one person said, uh, forever sleep. Right. I'm gonna, so, um, all right. So that would be one way to explain it. Now you could find a number of other uh, toxins that do actually indeed inhibit this process at some point along the way. Most of them will lead to very similar symptoms. Okay, um, there are complex three inhibitors, there are complex one inhibitors um, that have been um, noted. Uh, again, NADH levels <clears throat> will rise in those cases. Okay, what's interesting about those is that um, that electrons will accumulate prior to the point of inhibition in the in the electron transport chain. Right. So if complex three is, for instance, inhibited, then complex two and complex one will form more of the reduced state. Complex four, in that case, will be more of the oxidized state, because oxygen will be present. Um, and, uh, and whatever uh, electrons were found in complex four okay, will, will escape, and then there will be no more passage of electrons through complex three. Okay. So there are lots of different, um, uh, different electron transport chain inhibitors, um, but all of them are going to lead to, to symptoms similar to that, and they are obviously very dangerous, okay. um, very toxic. And so that, the reason I wanted to ask that question is just, a, is just to kind of help you start to assimilate some of the, the things that we've talked about okay, um, in this class. You, you could also say the same thing about an anaerobic tissue. And you don't even have to inhibit the electron transport chain, but if a tissue goes anaerobic, you lose that terminal electron acceptor, and the same kind of things happen. NADH levels will rise, citric acid cycle will, um, <clears throat> will be uh, inhibited, uh, pyruvate will no longer be converted to acetyl-CoA, and lactate levels will rise in those cells as well. Okay. Of course, typically, uh, especially if it's like muscle cells or something like that, it's not going to be deadly. Oxidative stress will be controlled for in that regard, and it's not going to kill the cells. Okay. All right. So, fascinating stuff. Yeah, you got a question? Yeah, so the question is, is the electron transport chain regulated or is it all just based off of the availability of uh, NADH and uh, succinate? So it's regulated, but not directly. It's regulated by the regulation of this. Okay, so ATP synthase can be regulated. And if the regulation of that goes down, then the electron transport chain will go down as well because it's coupled, right? Or if that goes up, then it will, um, uh, vice versa, the same thing will happen. Okay, And um, we're not going to talk too much about regulation of ATP synthase, but it can be regulated, yes. Other question, yeah. How long does it take to die from the cyanide poisoning? Yeah, so it would depend on the load of cyanide, I would imagine. I don't know, um, you know, but I would I would imagine that, you know, obviously the larger amount of cyanide ingested, the, the quicker the symptoms will set on and, and kill you. I mean, it, what you're really talking about is starvation of tissues. Um, and, and so it, that doesn't take very long, right, um, in an active individual. Of course, the, there would be an ingestion rate and all that kind of stuff. Other questions? OK. All right, now, one more thing to say here uh, in, in regards to the electron transport chain, and then we'll step fully into discuss, uh, discussing 
ATP synthase and its mechanism, okay? But I wanted to go ahead and talk a little bit about uncoupling. I've got another question for you as well, okay? So, um, but uncoupling, uh, we have said that these two processes are coupled, uh, meaning that they're codependent on one another. There are compounds that have been discovered that will lead to the uncoupling of them. And by uncoupling, we simply mean that the electron transport chain will, can run independently of the ATP synthase apparatus. Okay? You can't do it vice versa. Okay? You can't uncouple ATP synthase for the electron transport chain. ATP synthase can't really run and make ATP unless there's a proton gradient. Okay? So that can't be established without the electron transport chain. However, electron transport chain can run in the presence of what we call an uncoupler with, um, with the, um, um, without a functional ATP synthase. And the uncouplers will essentially uh, do this. They will take protons from here, grab onto them, and move them directly across the membrane in some fashion. Okay. And that would be, that red circle would be an quote unquote uncoupler we'll look at here, we'll look at a couple here in a little bit, uncoupler, okay. Now let me go ahead and ask a question, okay, on this. This will lead to some interesting um, discussions as well here, okay, but if uncoupling is occurring, um, what would happen to the PO ratio in the mitochondria, okay? So what would happen to PO ratios in a mitochondria that has been exposed to an uncoupler? What do you think? Are they going to go up? Are they going to go down? Talk to your neighbor about that and why that would be the case. And your marks get set, go. Okay? All right. About 30 seconds left. Okay, 10 seconds left, so submit an answer. If you haven't done so, says that I have 151 responses. I'm skeptical. Uh, <laughs> I don't think there's 150 of you. I think that counter must be wrong, okay? All right, go, okay. Um, increase, decrease, it would go down. Okay, it would go down, um, it would go down, I don't know, increase, um, lower, decrease, the PO rate usually would decrease, decrease. Okay, lower, lower. Okay, so let's look at our, uh, Let's look at our word cloud here, okay? Decrease, it looks like the majority of you, based off of that, would say decrease. Okay, so that is indeed correct. So let me come back to this slide here, okay? What we essentially see with an uncoupler is something that's going to take protons that are, right, being pumped to the P side and then going to move them across the membrane independent of something that can make ATP. Right, so we talked about the fact that NADH will lead to the translocation of 10 protons. Right? They go here, here, and here. Those are going to be pumped from electrons derived from NADH. Those 10 protons, if it takes four protons to make one ATP, then they can lead to the production of two and a half ATP. Let's say, though, however, that our uncoupler grabs four of those protons and moves them independent of the ATP synthase uh, molecule. Well, that then is going to lead to 
less protons that can make or generate ATP. So your, your PO ratio, like NADH, instead of making two and a half ATP, you can make one and a half ATP or, um, or even less, depending on how much uncoupled is present. Okay. Now, those protons that cross the membrane okay, and are released on the inside, that energy is going to be released as heat. Okay. Now, uncouplers, let's go ahead and look at how they might do this. So there is what we consider unnatural uncoupling, and then there would be natural uncoupling. Let's talk about unnatural uncoupling. So you are looking at two different molecules that have been discovered that are unnatural uncouplers. Let me go ahead and highlight the top one. The bottom one does essentially the same thing, but let's just look at the top one. It's a simpler molecule. 2,4-dinitrophenol, um, or just simply known as DNP, is an uncoupler. Uh, and you'll see here that it's got a proton bound to it. This would be something that you would expect to happen at lower pHs. Okay, it would be in a protonated state. If it were to get to a, a um, place where there would be higher pH, it could go, it could deprotonate at higher pH. Okay? Higher pHs are seen in the matrix. And lower pHs are seen in the intermembrane space, okay, especially at the surfaces of the membrane, which is where this would be found. DMP, and I don't know if we know this, I don't know this, but I don't know if even the scientific community knows this. DMP can pick up the proton, for sure, we know that. How it gets through the intermembrane is, I don't think, known. Okay, my suspicion is that it would have to be taken um, by some transporter. Okay, so there must be some transporter that has some specificity for it, interestingly. And then it will get into the, the matrix and it will release that proton. And then, of course, there will be some heat released. Now, interestingly, that molecule, DMP, um, was discovered as like the wonder drug in the 19, I think it was 30s, that it hit the market. And it was a wonder drug because you could lose weight using it without doing any work, right? Um, so it was taken off of the market because it was killing people, right? It, you don't want to really tinker with the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation in this way. So, um, and one of the pathologies of the individuals that were, were taking this was um, hy hyperthermia they had increased um, body core temperature, and that, that can actually be very dangerous, um, as, as you might uh, understand and know. All right, so DMP, actually, you can still find, if you Google DMP, you can still find people that are selling it and, and pushing it off as this weight loss um, drug. But it's, it's especially dangerous because there are some bodybuilders like, that have heard about this, and it's a good way to lose fat, and so they want to lose fat and you know, be all ripped and everything. I don't take DMP, if you're wondering, I, but <laughs> some of you caught that, that little subtle remark. Um, some of you are like, yeah, I can tell that you don't take DMP. Anyway, uh, <laughs> you're certainly not ripped. Anyway, uh, so it's those kind of things. But anyway, um, so don't take DMP. Okay, so that's our moral of, of today. Don't take DMP, it can kill you. Yeah. Is it like, if it's still being used, is it like if you take it in a really low concentration, it can be effective or what it's? It, yeah, without causing toxic. Yeah, without causing death. Right. Um, there are other symptoms that you you would have. The question is, um, is it, it can it still be effective at lower concentrations? And yes, it can be. The problem is 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 um, dosing it. How do you dose it? Okay, um, because everyone's metabolism is different. Uh, and, and the medical community and certainly the FDA is not going to allow experimentations on a drug that we know kills people, okay? um, it, especially for what is trying to be treated. Okay? There are other ways that are just as effective at losing weight. Okay? So, um, so that, this, drug, this will never be approved as an, an FDA-approved drug. Okay? Um, FCCP would be something similar. Okay? It has a similar um, modality. Okay? Now, that would be unnatural uncoupling. Don't take DMP. There is natural uncoupling, okay? Natural uncoupling um, 
can be found in brown adipose tissue. So uh, brown adipose tissue, I'm going to highlight what this would do in certainly a human being. Uh, brown adipose tissue is, is enriched in infants in particular. So the thing about an infant is that they have a really high surface area to volume ratio, meaning that they have a very difficult time regulating um, internal body temperature, right? Because they lose a lot of heat for a very small amount of volume. Okay, um, and so they have quite a bit of brown adipose tissue that is surrounding their vital organs. Now, brown adipose tissue, uh, the difference between brown adipose tissue and what would be called white adipose tissue, aside from the color, is that in brown adipose tissue, there's a lot of mitochondria, and that's why they're actually brown, because there is significantly more mitochondria in that tissue. Okay. Now, what you are looking at is just a portion of a pathway that can lead to what's called non-shivering thermogenesis. Brown adipose tissue, the reason that it's encasing these vital organs is to bring and regulate body temperature to, to keep, uh, keep vital organs at the appropriate functioning temperature. Okay? And how that's done is, first of all, through just a, um, the hypothalamus sensing that uh, the body is cooling down temperatures are going down. That will lead to a series of signals that will eventually lead to the release of norepinephrine. Norepinephrine will bind to a beta adrenergic receptor, the G protein coupled receptor, okay, very simple, uh, very similar um, to the epinephrine beta adrenergic receptor we talked about. That will lead to, of course, activation of G protein. G protein leads to activation of adenyl cyclase. Adenyl cyclase makes cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP activates protein kinase A, which we've talked about. Okay, all of that we've talked about. What we haven't yet talked about, and we're going to go ahead and talk about this when we get the lipids, but uh, PKA will increase what's called beta oxidation, the rate of essentially fatty acid oxidation. So it'll lead to the increase of triacylglyceride breakdown. The fatty acids, fatty acids will then be converted to carbon dioxide and water, and a whole lot of NADH and FADH2 is made in that process, okay? That's going to feed the electron transport chain, as we've talked about, that's going to lead to, of course, the translocation of these protons, okay? Now, why am I telling you all this? Well, I get to this here. That is called... Um, UCP1 is called the uncoupling protein. Okay, UCP, uncoupling protein. That moves these protons back through this membrane and produces heat. Okay. So if body core temperature starts to go down, specifically in an infant, which has lots of brown adipose tissue, these signals will essentially lead to the production of heat through non-shivering pathways. Shivering is another way to do it, right? Just produce a bunch of kinetic energy, right? Burn ATP and produce heat, okay? This case, though, is uncoupling proton, uh, a pro not proton, protein, um, uses the, the proton gradient that would make ATP to make heat. This is one of a family of proteins, uncoupling proteins. Okay. You'll also find these proteins um, in brown adipose tissue in like hibernating animals and, and other interesting physiological things. Okay. So. In fact, I think the first uncoupling protein that was discovered was um, named thermogenin okay. for its role in producing you know, ther thermal energy. All right, so that's uncoupling. DMP, unnatural, don't take it. Okay, brown adipose tissue, you don't have much of it. <laughs> okay, so, any questions? Any questions on this? Yeah. Is there some kind of signaling defect in the production of the UCP1, like in the transcription of the gene, mm -hmm. in translation, I guess, um, in tissues where it's not supposed to be present? Is that like lethal or is that a disease state? Oh, I don't think so. All right, so what you're saying is, is like an epigenetic change that would lead to increased expression of uncoupling protein. Um, um, is that a disease state that's been observed? I don't think so. I, I, th and I, I would have to check on this because I don't know the answer to this question, but I, I think that the uncoupling protein may be a gene found in mitochondrial DNA. Um, 
And so regulation of that expression, I'm not sure of. Although ha having said that, I'm not sure if that would be true either because your normal mitochondria don't express the uncoupling protein. And there's not as sophisticated methods of, of shutting down genetic expression in mitochondrial DNA. It's pretty small. So it's probably a genomic gene. And I, I don't know if it's ever been observed to be expressed ubiquitously. If it were, it would be problematic, yes. Yeah. Other questions? No? OK. I think that then is going to do it in terms of electron transport chain. Um, of course, today we've talked about inhibition of that electron transport chain and then a coupling of the oxidative phosphorylation. Um, what we want to do for the rest of uh, lecture nine, we certainly aren't going to finish this today. We'll finish it on Friday, though, probably. Um, will be to talk about the structure and mechanism of ATP synthase. Okay, we have now worked very hard to find out how a proton gradient is established. We understand that the proton gradient can lead to ATP and a certain amount of ATP based off the number of protons that are flowing across that membrane. So what we want to do then is is to look at how ATP synthase can make ATP using a proton gradient. Okay. And ultimately, this is going to come down to conformational changes in a protein. Um, however, before we do that, we're, we want to look at, and to do that, we need to really understand the structure of ATP synthase and its thermodynamics. Okay, so uh, what you were looking at here would be a slide. We have one slide on the thermodynamics of ATP synthase. Um, and if you understand this slide, you'll understand lots of what we're going to talk about on Friday, okay? But let me do this first. So let's talk about a typical enzyme. And we could even say typical enzyme like, let's say, um, phosphoglycerate kinase. And all of you said, ah, yes, phosphoglycerate kinase. Hmm. Isn't that an enzyme in glycolysis, catalyzes the seventh step in a substrate level phosphorylation event? You got it. You got to really on it. Uh, people that can make it through a snowstorm like you did, I'm sure, know that. Okay. So, but anyway, phosphoglycerate kinase, th th we could talk about others. Um, this figure is from your book. I'm not really sure why they drew it like this, but I'm going to go ahead and get rid of some things here. Um, and I'm going to add some things to this. Okay. So I'm going to come over here. And we're going to draw essentially the reaction coordinate diagram of this enzyme. And we'll just say E plus S. The S in this case substrate would be ADP and 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, um, going back to the seventh step in glycolysis. Okay? Um, and so the very first step okay, of an enzyme, hopefully you know this is, of course, binding its substrate. So that would make the ES complex. Okay? Now in a typical what we call um, substrate level phosphorylation event, the next step to make ATP is going to be where the energy is, is needed. Okay, and that's what's shown here, this large hill. Okay, and that will lead to EP, where P is ATP and 3 phosphoglycerate. Okay, ATP being what I want to highlight. They have get rid of this. They have P here. EP, meaning the product is still bound to the enzyme. Okay. The last step in the enzyme will be just simply a release step. Okay. E plus P. Now, it might be more steps than that, but this will suffice. Okay. And what I want to highlight for us here is that this step where all this energy has to be used, this would be energy to make ATP. And in substrate level phosphorylation, that energy is going to be provided by the other high energy compound, 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate in this case. Okay. And um, we'll provide that energy is sim simply dephosphorylated uh, and gives this phosphate group up into ADP. Okay. Now, move over here and look at the thermodynamics of ATP synthase. So that's the molecule of interest in oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, and what we have here, okay, coming back to this, this would be E plus S. Okay, the enzyme plus a substrate, 
ADP and inorganic phosphate. There is, a, of course, the, the binding event that will make ES nothing really different here than your regular enzyme. Okay. Now, here's where the major difference comes because the next step, this one here, the small activation energy, is going to make EP, where P is just ATP. There's nothing else. Okay. It doesn't have one 3 best phosphoglycerate. It doesn't have one of these other high energy compounds that it can drive the phosphate from and make ATP. You'll notice also that going from ES, and S, by the way, is, well, they have it listed here. I don't need to draw it. ADP and inorganic phosphate that's all bound to the enzyme. It's actually a small decrease in free energy, indicating that the production of ATP and phosphorylating ADP is actually energetically favorable, okay? Which is pretty cool, okay? Now, you'll notice though that the next portion here, okay, there has to be this absorption of energy to then go from EP to E plus P. And we can say that this is the energy uh, to release, not make, but release ATP. And our key difference here is release versus make, right, between our two enzymes. Turns out that ATP synthase has almost a picomolar KD for ATP. Really strong affinity, okay. Uh, for ATP. It forms the number of non-covalent interactions with ATP, all of which have to be broken to get ATP out into solution where it can be used. Okay. To break those non-covalent interactions, the binding energy between the enzyme and the, pro and, and the product um, requires significant amount of energy. Okay. And so what we are going to be looking at then in the production of ATP by ATP synthase is essentially a molecular crowbar that can remove ATP from the active site of this enzyme. Okay. Not some high energy compound like what we'd see in substrate level phosphorylation to make ATP. Okay. Now if you understood that and understood what I just said, then everything else from there is downhill. Okay. And some of you are saying it's never downhill in biochemistry. Okay. It's less steep of a grade than normal. Okay. Questions? No? Okay, awesome. Let's go find our crowbar and how that crowbar can be moved by a proton gradient. That's what we're doing. Okay, so let's look at the structure then of ATP synthase. Okay, um, overview first of all. Uh, on your left, I mean, the difference between what you're looking at on your left and on your right is just, you know, obviously a drawing, a cartoon rendering of an artist's rendition of this. And what you see on your right is high resolution structure. Um, we know the structure of most of ATP synthase, but not all of it. Okay. Now, we will oftentimes, or this enzyme is oftentimes referred to as FO, F1, uh, that's not an I, F1. Got to get rid of that. There we go. F1 ATP synthase. Okay. Um, this looks like a zero. It should be an O. I'm going to go ahead and make it a little bit more pronounced O. It is O. It's not zero. Okay. O stands for legomycin. Legomycin is an inhibitor of ATP synthase. Okay. All right. But when we call it FO, F1, um, FO, there's two really main components of the enzyme. And I'm going to go ahead and circle what's called FO. All the subunits here that have or have been named with an, uh, a letter from the English alphabet are part of FO. So that's FO. Everything outside of that with Greek lettering for that subunits is F1. Okay. Both of them are needed for the enzyme to make ATP, as you might imagine. There are a large number of subunits listed here. We're going to go through not all of them, certainly, but we're going to talk about the, the main highlights. Okay. Um, what you see on the right is missing some subunits. We don't have the crystal structure of all of the subunits. Okay. 
Um, if you were, though, to carry this out, the membrane would be right here. Okay. So that's the membrane. FO contains what would be considered the transmembrane region of the, the enzyme. Okay. F1 is, F1 is in the, the inside. Okay. Inside here. Now, <clears throat> let's go ahead and, and go and look at F1 component first, uh, and then we'll look at um, FO component. So on our next slide, what we're going to do is essentially look at all of this minus these two, okay? Uh, what's in um, blue and, and pink, right? So this is the majority of what would be considered F1. F1 as a total is nine subunits only seven of which are shown here, okay? And sometimes we'll refer to this as kind of like a lollipop structure, okay? Because it looks like, like what you see in blue looks like a lollipop and then there's this green extension coming out of it that looks like a stick, okay? Um, so uh, seven subunits uh, that you're looking at here make up that lollipop structure. If we put our eyeball right here, okay, we'll get this view over here. Okay, so we're now we're looking at it from the top. Um, and when you look at it from the top, we have the seven subunits listed. And I'm going to go ahead and, and highlight these. There are what we call three alpha and three beta subunits. Okay. And each alpha and beta subunit make up a pair. And I'm going to go ahead and circle the pairs here. Here's one of the pairs. Okay. Here's another one of the pairs of alpha and beta subunit. And then finally, here's another one of the pairs. Okay. And you can see alpha, beta, alpha, beta, alpha, beta. Okay. So they come in these pairs, three each, and they alternate as we go through them. Okay. Now, when you look at what's in between them, this guy, uh, let's see, is, I guess, it's kind of greenish color. This guy right here, that's called the gamma shaft or sometimes it's called the central stalk. There's only one of them. It's the stick of the lollipop. If we're to look over here on the, on the left, this, this portion of it here, C, you can see that entire stick, okay? Essentially what we're looking at here is what you look at here, but we've removed two of the alpha and beta subunits so that you can see the stick extending into the middle of them. Now, um, the alpha and beta pairs, this is really important to understand this whole thing. Okay. The al each alpha and beta pair comprise an active site for ATP production. Essentially, the active site is sandwiched between the alpha and beta subunits. Okay. More in beta than it is in alpha, but you have to have components from each of them. Each alpha and beta pair has the possibility of adopting three different conformations. And those are th conformations are listed here. There's an O conformation, okay, that would be no S substrate, ADP and intermediate phosphate, or ATP. I guess, let me go ahead and write ADP, PI, ATP. It's empty, open, okay? That confirmation, if you look down here, is listed right here, O, okay? This alpha and beta pair is in the O confirmation. If we were to go clockwise from that, and this is important, this direction, if we were to move clockwise in the clockwise direction, the next alpha and beta pair is gonna be in what's called the T confirmation. And the T confirmation is ATP bound. You can see ATP here. High affinity for ATP again. Okay. And then finally, the last one here, this is what we call the L conformation. And the L conformation has ADP and inorganic phosphate bound. And that will be counterclockwise to the alpha and beta pair and the T conformation. Not counterclockwise, clockwise, I'm sorry. Clockwise. Now, what dictates what is in O, what is in T, and what is in L? Well, what dictates what's in O, T, and L 
is the alpha and beta pairs interaction with the stick, the central stock or the gamma shaft. Okay? And the gamma shaft okay, is an asymmetric subunit and has different interactions with each of the alpha and beta pair that it's, that it's contacting. Right? And we can just put, let's, let's just do this here, let's just put a dot here on the, on the central stock or the gamma shaft and say wherever that dot's pointed, that alpha and beta pair will be in the open conformation. Okay. Now, if that then can be turned in the direction of this arrow, and move that pink dot, okay, essentially the central stock, in that direction, it will force a T to O conformational change. And if you go from T to O, you're going from ATP bound to empty, which means that ATP has been removed. Okay. So our molecular crowbar is the central stock. And if it can keep moving through that, it will just keep forcing conformational changes. So this, if that happens, this will go from T to O. Now interestingly, this will then, the, the one adjacent to it that has ADP and enteriantic phosphate bound, that will go to T. This will go to L. And it will just keep doing that as this thing turns in the clockwise direction. Okay. Now, as again, just to highlight this, if it goes T to O, ATPs come out. Friday is a really good day to talk about what turns that central stock. Okay, so we'll look at how that's going to turn and how a proton gradient can force that. And we'll get into some details, but we can't get into a ton. Okay? All right, so I will see you on Friday. Please be safe on your way home. You are now on officially a snow day. I know I'm the dirty son of a gun that brings you in right before <laughs> snow day occurs. Okay? All right, have a good rest of your day.